Good evening, everyone. I'm Therese Lagama. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Curator here at the Kennedy Center. Welcome to our Impactful Words event with this evening featuring Stacey Abrams. She's a best-selling New York Times author with her bestseller, Rogue Justice. A bit about tonight's author. Stacey Abrams is a New York Times bestselling author, entrepreneur, and political leader. She served as the minority leader in the Georgia House of Representatives, and she was the first black woman to become a gubernatorial nominee for a major party in United States history. <laughs> Abrams has launched multiple nonprofit organizations devoted to democracy protection, voting rights, and effective public policy. She has also co-founded successful companies, including a financial services firm an energy and infrastructure consulting firm, and the media company SageWorks Productions, Inc. And in just a couple of minutes, Stacy will be joined by Un Yang, the Emmy Award-winning anchor of News 4 with NBC, and the evening's moderator. After Stacy and Un chat, they'll turn to your questions, which you submitted on the index cards. We will cover as many questions as we can in our allotted time together. We're so grateful to you for being here. Thank you so much for supporting us and free programming Millennium Stage Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, go to Millennium Stage on the Kennedy Center's website to find us. Please join me now in welcoming to the stage Stacy Abrams. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being so nice. I may not leave. <laughs> so I'm going to read a little bit of Rogue Justice to you. I promise I won't give away anything. I won't give away much. <laughs> so we're starting in the early stages where chapter five Avery is meeting the person who's going to send her on her next adventure. He reached into his bag for another slim file and pressed it to his chest. If I take this to the authorities, they'll ignore me or arrest me. Preston took a deep breath and continued, you took down the president of the United States because he posed a threat to our nation. I know the impeachment is controversial, but I believe in what you did, Avery. You're a patriot, someone willing to go to great See, somebody didn't like that. <laughs> Someone willing to go to great lengths to protect us all. Extending the files to her, he confessed, I'm not brave enough to come forward, and I'm not smart enough to figure this out. You're the only person I could think of who can. Avery reflexively accepted the bundle, hedging. I'm not a detective, Preston. What happened with, Justin Wynn, with Justice Wynn was a fluke. Right now, I'm barely a law clerk. I don't think I can help you. Just read it, you'll understand. The passcode is 501801. With that, he hurried away. Perplexed by the encounter, she sifted through what he'd left and opened the second folder. A single sheet of paper rested inside. The chart included 11 names arranged in alphabetical order. At quick glance, Avery recognized the names as federal district court judges hailing from various parts of the country, appointed to staggered terms that required them to trek to DC several times a year. She knew for a fact that four of them lived close, within 20 miles of DC. As her eyes skimmed the list once more, she felt a sharp stab of alarm course through her. The innocuous list was anything but. The names of the judges weren't a secret. Anyone who knew where to look could find them the dates of their appointments, the circuit courts where they sat, even an abbreviated history of their journey as judges. But the club to which they belonged was only slightly less exclusive than the court she served. Avery glanced up haltingly, catching a glimpse of Preston as he headed for the exit. The names on the list were the members of the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, one of the most powerful judicial bodies in America. The 11 judges were appointed for seven year terms and tasked with one job, to secretly review and approve of electronic surveillance, physical search, 
and other investigative actions for foreign intelligence purposes. These were the judges who decided spy warrants and authorized eavesdropping on terrorists, foreign and domestic. The judges' work involved top secret intelligence and often affected the course of national security, and Judge Francesca Whitner was one of them. Avery shut the folder and surveyed the vast ballroom again for Preston. He had plowed into the crowd of lingering attendees that was log jammed at the exit. She scooped up her belongings and the phone he'd given her and raced to catch him. Fixated on his movements, she bumped into someone and muttered an apology. Watch where you're going. I'm sorry. She shifted to go around, but a woman blocked her path. The female half of the conversation about her she'd overheard. Through gritted teeth, Avery said, excuse me. The woman grabbed her shoulder with fake nails that dug in deep. There's no excuse for someone like you. Going after a war hero on all on the word of a senile old man. He shouldn't be fighting for his jobs. You should be out of one. Avery wrenched her arm free and, peru and perused the area near the door. No stocky guy with a camouflage backpack. Preston had slipped out. Frustrated, she snapped, I bumped into you and I apologized. Grab me again and you'll be the one who's sorry. Are you threatening me? The loud accusation caused heads to whip around. Out of the corner of her eye, Avery saw at least two cell phone users activate their cameras. <laughs> Beyond the doors, real reporters had much more expensive devices hungry for a story. She wrestled her outrage into place. A viral video would be catnip to the late night comedians. Plastering on a look of contrition, she pitched her volume to match. Like I said, I apologize for bumping into you. A guy left his phone and I was trying to catch him. Playing to the crowd, Avery waved the black case at the watching audience. Does anyone know Preston Davies? He forgot his phone. The attendees, robbed of an altercation, immediately lost interest. A few shook their heads in response and her assailant sucked at absurdly white teeth. No, I don't know him. Well, thank you anyway for your help. Avery intoned sweetly. She sped toward the door, careful to avoid another collision. Preston had a head start, but she'd be damned if he was going to drop a nuclear secret in her lap and disappear. Pushing through the double doors, a couple of photogs, la a fo sorry, a couple of photogs lazily clicked their cameras in her direction. She ignored their perfunctory questions and glanced both ways. No sign of him on this lower level. She rabbited up the escalator that would bring her to the main lobby. Hopping off, she quickly checked out the milling people in the larger space. Beyond the judicial conference, the Calvert DuPont Hotel placed toast to a medical device convention, a training session for aspiring women in politics, a farewell event hosted by local law enforcement at the hotel's very popular bar, and at least two weddings. When she didn't spot Preston in their numbers, she made her way to the phalanx of glass doors that opened onto a motor lobby filled with Escalades, Yukons, and Navigators. A hopeful bank of taxis waited farther up, on the street level, cursing the Ubers and Lyfts that arrived in rapid succession to ferry their erstwhile passengers. One of the yellow cabs idling 50 feet from the exit unexpectedly lurched to get around a taxi parked in front of it. Avery spotted Preston Davies watching her through the side window with his hangdog look firmly in place. He slouched low, as though hunching his shoulders would make him invisible, a three-year-old's trick. Trying to get to him, she squeezed through the knot of conference goers, ready to head out to the airport or across town. From her vantage point, she could now see his impassioned plea for the driver to move. A wad of cash dropped through the plexiglass divider, and the cabbie was convinced. The taxi rammed forward, barely missing the bumper of the car in front, before Avery could reach the door. Damn! The cab surged up the driveway and melted into, emerged onto Connecticut. Avery watched in frustration as the driver sped up. When another car slipped in front of it, forcing it to slow down, she saw her chance. She began to weave through the crowd, keeping her eye on the taxi as it inched forward down the block. As she reached the end of the hotel's portico, Preston's getaway car got into queue behind a metro bus. Avery weighed the importance of chasing him. Early rush hour meant that Preston's fast escape would be more of a crawl. She could probably catch up with him, but what would she say? 
she glanced at the phone still clutched in her hand. First, she could ask whose cell phone she was holding and why he gave it to her. Second, she'd welcome a bit more time to interrogate why he chose her to be his Nancy Drew. She was still deciding her next move when a trim jogger in navy leggings and a matching fitted hoodie trotted along the sidewalk and headed directly for the cab. The jogger stopped, knelt, and reached for her shoe. When she stood, something caught Avery's eye. Maybe it was the sudden stillness of the jogger or the vain hope that Preston would come to his senses. Seconds later, the back passenger window shattered. Pop, pop, pop. Above the din of cars and buses, the sharp report of gunshots rose loud and clear. Soon, so did the screams of passersby as the cab driver tried to escape the assassin by swerving onto the sidewalk. A moment later, another round of gunfire ended with the taxi rear-ending the metro bus. The jogger, now a sprinter, sped away from the scene as voices shouted for her to stop. She vanished down a nearby alleyway, but no one gave chase to the slender brunette. Avery's eyes went back to the cab, but no one stumbled forth from it. For an instance, Avery thought about running up to the crashed car that echoed with a steady honk. Chills coursed through her. She didn't need to see inside to know both occupants were dead. Her stomach heaved and her hand clenched spasmodically. She just witnessed an execution. Then she remembered the phone in her hand, a phone from a dead man. Now, please welcome Un Yang to the stage. Hello. Hi. You all want to know what happens next, right? <laughs> if you haven't read the book already, it only gets better from there. Um, so many questions. I am delighted and so excited to be here with you, Stacey Abrams, and clearly the audience here is as well. Um, we have a little time, but it's going to go by fast. So I will try to ask my questions as quickly as I can. Um, this book takes place in Washington. I've lived in Washington, D.C. nearly my entire life. Uh, and I love reading about the place, like Anacostia, Laurel, I've been there, right? <laughs> That's always the best part about reading books that take place in your hometown. What do you like about D.C.? And um, how does your familiarity with the nation's capital influence this book and your writing in general? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to have me here, and thank you all for being here, and thank you to the Kennedy Center for thinking I'm important enough to invite, so yay me. <laughs> <laughs> so Avery's story takes place, she's in her mid to late 20s. I spent time in D.C. first as a college student. Uh, at the end of my uh, senior year of college, I interned uh, for the EPA. So I was in Anacostia, and it was before the Anacostia of today. <laughs> so I was in Anacostia in, in the mid-90s. <laughs> it's a very different Anacostia. Right. Uh, and then I came back the following summer and interned with OMB. And so for me, part of Avery's story is anchored in my memory of being you know, young enough to enjoy DC and poor enough to not know as much about DC as I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> like I, I was limited. I know DuPont Circle really well. Um, in the very first book, there's a scene in Kramer Books because that was one of the places I could afford. Yes. Uh, and, Who you know, didn't have a date at Kramer Books, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> Although I must also call out Sixth and I, so, and oh, Pros yes. and, yeah. and Politics, yeah. so there we go. Um, but so for me, the, the story, I love DC. I love the intersection of politics mm -hmm. and education. We have this extraordinary woman, uh, Dr. So I want to call her doctor, but Patricia Walters, uh, who is the widow of Dr. Juan Walters. This is a place that has brought such history and such progress, but is also steeped in scandal and danger. Uh, not nearly as much danger as I like to create, but, <laughs> <laughs> but all of the pieces of, of what we think about in terms of intrigue can be found here. In New York, you write about money. And if you're writing about California, it's about Hollywood. 
but DC is a place of almost pure power. Mm. And the dynamics of power, those struggles, seen through the eyes of someone who can witness it but can't actually hold it, is what fascinates me about writing about DC. Oh, that's such a great answer. And, and speaking of, I mean, you have a president facing impeachment, a divided Supreme Court. I'm talking about the book. <laughs> International intrigue, uh, whistleblowers, and scapegoats in between. I know, sound familiar. How do you decide which news headlines to include in your book? And then how do you pull from real life to weave it into your narrative? Okay, so I, this is really true. I started writing the first book in 2008. I finished it, oh. so I was, I was well, working. Well, you're busy. A, well, I was working as a tax attorney. I was under contract for my romance novels but I wanted to try a different style of writing. So in between you know, making a living and, and writing my books, I had a friend, Teresa Wynn Roseboro, who gave me this idea. And so I started writing While Justice Sleeps. So that book really, got, basically I wrote it in 20, 20, 2009, and then 2010 when I tried to sell it, nobody would buy it because it was a story of a corrupt president involved in international intrigue. <laughs> and I was told that was absurd. <laughs> and that the fact and the, the fact that it sort oh of it was anchored around the Supreme Court, they thought, well, the Supreme Court's boring. Who would care about the Supreme Court? <laughs> and so when While Justice Sleeps came out uh, ten years later, oh. what feels now like a little bit of prescience was just coincidence. And so the headlines of Rogue Justice really were written a decade before they were real. So I, I didn't know we were had have an impeachment right now. <laughs> This is very much uh, life, not imitating art, but certainly echoing my art. But what I do try to, to weave into my books, and the, the construct of Rogue Justice, you'll find out, like the fact that the FISA court is actually under review, that by April 19th, the Congress, if it decides to go to work, has to <laughs> decide whether to reauthorize Section 702, which governs much of the work of the FISA court. And I didn't know that was going to be up this year, but when I wrote it, I wrote it because I was reading about the FISA court and I was thinking, we have a court of people who are only accountable to a small cadre of mm. folks. And I'm fascinated overall by the fact that the Supreme Court, that our federal court system is impervious to certain forms of accountability. You know, the president can be removed because of section of Article 25, you know, sorry, yes, of our, um, amendment, the 25th Amendment. Congress, you can just vote them out of office. But Article 3 judges hold their positions unless they commit high crimes or misdemeanors or die. Simply being unable to do your job or, oh, I don't know, engaging in some form of mild corruption, unless it rises to the level of an actual illegal act, these are some of the most powerful people that no one knows about. And what happens mm. if they are actually found to be susceptible? And so for me, the, the headline grab was, I was thinking about the FISA court. I was also thinking about what happened in Texas uh, when the power grid went out mm -hmm. and discovered that we don't actually have a power. We, there's no one in charge of electricity in America. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's like, an, it's like a general person's agreement across the country heading into Canada and down to Mexico. So all of those pieces to me come together. So I write about what intrigues me and what scares me, and I want it to be entirely possible but not completely probable. Mm. Well, now I want to know what you're thinking about right now yeah. for the next <laughs> book so we can figure out what's coming down the pike, it'll right? Be out next, it'll be out in 25, so yeah. Do you hear that? Yeah. All right. We have to wait. I, okay. I'm a little scared myself. But. Okay. <laughs> Now that's a good teaser. Um, and there are, there's a lot of action in this book. You have blackmail, corruption, the deep fakes, which is very upsetting, um, the tech world on a whole nother level, I feel like I'm learning as I'm reading. Um, and while so much of this seems fantastical, right? We, you, we just said truth is uh, stranger than fiction. Um, how much drama do you think really goes beyond behind the scenes in our society and government that we don't even know about? Like you said, possible but not probable, but what don't we know? <laughs> I mean, I could tell you, but somebody might have to tell you. Um, no, I, so here's how I approach it. 
my younger sister is a federal judge. Her life is not as as you know filled with travail okay. as uh, this book would would have it be, at least you know, so far. But what I do know is that you have humans who have these jobs, and people do people make mistakes. People are implicated in these large constructs that when they start making choices, they never imagine this is where it ends up. Mm -hmm. Prison is filled with a lot of people who just didn't know how to stop before they kept digging, mm -hmm. or who didn't know how to say, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, it is usually not some grand scheme. It is one mistake after another, usually trying to fix the previous mistake without taking responsibility. And so I think that part of, I just heightened the tension and the danger of those moments but I ground it in the reality of the people I know. Having, you know, I, I didn't work in Congress, but I was in the state legislature, uh, and Congress is filled with people who were legislators uh, at the state level, and I know some of the dumb things they did. I know some of the complicated stories they told themselves to justify behavior. Uh, but I also worked with people of really good heart and good intention who get distracted by power. And a lot mm -hmm. of the writing I do is, is investigating. How does power work? Who has it? How do you get it? How do you lose it? How do you borrow it? Um, Avery borrows power a lot. But I, I wanted her to be a heroine who has authority, I'm sorry, has responsibility, but doesn't actually have authority. Because that's when power matters the most. When you've got to do something and nobody wants you to do it, and very few people are willing to help you, and if you mess up, they are not going to be there. To, they're not going to have your back. So how do you make those choices, especially when so much is on the line? And can you talk about that human part of us, the power part, the, the stuff you witness in Washington, um, and what makes, like you said, what makes someone not be able to stop? And really, what is it about this power, and what have you seen? I mean, we've seen... <laughs> We see it in our daily lives. Like the person who insists on you know, seeing the manager because the cashier didn't give them exactly what they wanted. Mm. Like that mm. whole trope is just a, a <clears throat> microcosm of the human notion of who should be in charge. Who's mm. above me, who's below me? Do I get to interrogate your, your privilege, your space? People like to be better than someone else. Not everyone feels that way. But you know, when you get that, when you're driving in the mall, back when we had malls, um, <laughs> or when you're driving somewhere and there's that parking space and you get to it first, your pride of place is huge, yes. especially if the person who was trying to get there like flipped you off or something. Like you're suddenly like, well, look what I got. Now, have nuclear codes attached to that. <laughs> That's because, so, so, so part of it is people want, they, they want to have some sense of control they like having privilege. They also, and it's, it's basic human nature, the question is how far do you let it drive you? A lot of us want to be meaner and pettier than we are, but we at least have some home training. <laughs> but the ones who don't, those are the ones who, you know, get a, you know, they'll get a Twitter feed or they get some money and they get a, a camera on them and the worst impulses they have becomes fodder for how they grow and we feed that. So we become both audience and victim of what gets created by the sense of who should have power. And it does, you know, I am not a road rage driver, but if I am signaling for a parking space on the street in Washington, you all know what that's like, and I'm signaling and someone try, I, the something comes up right in yes. here and raises, and you have to tamp that down. Yes. You know what I mean? So, exactly. and then you're saying, and that's where it comes from. And imagine, imagine if you had special license plate that told you you could park wherever you want, right. whenever and you want. And not get tickets. And not get tickets. Wow, okay. Um, I'm also <laughs> not a tech savvy person, and my IT team hates me because I'm calling for every little thing, but we get deep into it in this book. Um, in this age of AI, um, digital media, what are your concerns about us being under constant surveillance? Because you know our phones are listening to us, right? You just have to open up Instagram to know, as soon as I have talked about skincare, puppies, and recipes, I mean, my feed is flooded. Um, cyber attacks, virtual warfare. What are your thoughts on this? What, is, what are your concerns in this age? Well, to, so I believe in doing very deep research, uh, which is why I'm scared about my next book. 
that. Oh my God. I'm like, I'm learning so much and I don't I want to I can't wait know to it. 2025. Now I have to know what's going on. So with this one, I, I first wanted to make sure I understood cyber attacks. And so I spent, I, I, I read a lot of websites. I read a couple of books on it. Uh, there's this fantastic podcast called Dark Web Diaries, um, Darknet Diaries. And it makes you, you basically want to just have the Mr. Wizard calculator and that's it. And you don't ever want off. it. Oh my like you gosh. just, you, you miss the like the red light. Um, but by doing that, I was able to hear about all of these things most of us never know happen. So there are a couple of uh, references I make in the book that are real of attacks that have happened in this country or around the world that most of us have never heard of but could have crippled our entire economy. And so I try my best to I try to learn enough that when I write, someone who actually knows what they're talking about knows that I respect them. So they respect the book. They're like, you got this thing kind of wrong, but it's not so wrong that they're like, oh my God, she doesn't know what she's talking about. It's more like, huh, she's a really nice amateur. Like that's my mission. <laughs> and I did the same thing on the energy grid. Like I was wondering why did Texas melt down? Yeah. And then I started understanding, well, cause. <laughs> because this is, our energy grid is remarkably porous. And I, there's, I actually met someone from FERC, the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission. I was like, I've never read a book about FERC before. <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm a tax attorney. I got you, I got you. Uh, so it's, for me, it's also about taking things that feel obscure. So in my very first, you know, While Justice Leaves, yeah. I really focused on the Office of Science and Technology, mm -hmm. which no one knows about, but has a lot of power. And so I like to take things that are obscure or that we just haven't had a reason to pay attention to that are real and have power in our lives and that right now are working well enough that we don't have to pay attention. And I think that's the fundamental. Most things work so well in our lives, if we don't have to pay attention, we don't think we need to know. So you don't mind the, the puppies and the food Right. because your phone does all the other stuff you need. Yes. So you're willing to sacrifice privacy and a little bit of peace of mind because the convenience is so strong. Exactly. Yeah. We do that with our government every day. Mm. And because we don't interrogate what's happening, because we don't ask how did this actually come to be or why didn't this go horribly wrong, the comfort we have creates either space for innovation or space for mischief. And I tend to choose mischief. What can we do about this? Vote. Yeah. <laughs> That's the bottom line, right? I mean, and, and that, I mean, that's a glib answer, but the reality is you have to trust government to do right because it has such depth and reach. That's why it matters who's in charge. Uh, we, as much as we read about the president, you can read about these sort of megalomaniacal like, county officials who can ruin entire lives. Mm. And it's because we don't, we don't vote, or when we vote, we don't think that the jobs we're voting for matter that much, so we kind of, we just vote for the last guy who got the job. We vote for the I. Like, we don't ask, like, did you do the job when you got it? Politics is one of the few jobs that you get where if someone hires you, and then leaves you alone for four years and hope, like it's not even that they hope, we hope you don't steal. We're <laughs> like, did anybody catch you? <laughs> we don't hope that you didn't do something wrong. We're like, eh, my life hasn't gotten measurably worse. Or if it has, can you blame, can I blame it on someone else? Mm. And so I think that the, the dynamic is we have to be more engaged. Voting is the beginning of the process. It cannot be an activity, it can't be an event. It has to be an activity. And that's why democracy work is so important to me can't be an event, it has to be an activity. can't be an event, it has to be an activity. And you said we have to trust, but here's the thing, people want to refuse to believe the truth in front of their eyes, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm gonna read a quote from the Speaker of the House in this book. For a whole lot of folks, an unprecedented glut of information and a distrust of government have given them permission to create their own sense of reality. That's what the House Speaker mm -hmm. says in this book. Um, how, as a society, do we address this? They don't want to believe what's true. They don't want to trust, no matter how much evidence, what's before their eyes. 
it's become what I, I find it terrifying. We've, the wonder of technology has also allowed us to curate our own realities. Uh, I point this out, so for anyone under 40, this is not gonna make any sense to you, but <laughs> when I was growing up, I'm, I'm 50 now, you know, we all got the same information. The question was, which guy was gonna tell us about it? Was it Tom Brokaw, mm -hmm. Dan Rather, mm -hmm. I was a Peter Jennings person. Uh, me too! And if you were really, really nerdy, you watched Jim Lehrer. Yeah, oh yeah. But, but we all got the same news. It was the same information yes. just delivered. The only choice was which channel was going to tell you about it. And then when, when news proliferated, when we had CNN and then Fox and then the internet, we fractured the common source of data. And where we find ourselves is that you're not only encouraged to curate your own reality, you are provided with the tools to deny the existence of other realities. Yes. And we as a society have allowed some leaders and those who are purported leaders to diminish the, it used to, not just diminishing truth, but we used to be proud of being smart. It used to be an aspiration that you had to know what you were talking about. <laughs> and that has not, that is no longer the metric, or if it is, your, real, your information doesn't have to be real. It just has to be repeated. Mm. And that's the danger that we find ourselves in. And so that's why misinformation and disinformation are so critical and it's why the deep fake was so important to me that this woman who was off doing something else she shouldn't have been doing gets accused of something else. And part of our hubris is that we can't admit that we were wrong about what we thought we knew and so we, get, we burrow in deeper into our sense of what reality is. So one of the reasons people can't be convinced, it's because they've built their psyche and their sense of self around this curated universe they have. And so if you tell someone what you're saying isn't true, you're wrong, you're telling them they're stupid, mm. you're telling them they are incapable, and you're telling them their reality is false. We have a hard time when someone tells us that the music we don't like is wrong. Mm. Imagine if someone tells you everything you think you know is wrong. We are hardwired to reject that. And so our tension has to come back to how do we create space for people to be more inquisitive? And how do we create grace for people to be wrong? How do we? <laughs> How do you do that? How do you talk to people? So, <laughs> Stacy, how do you do it? So I, I begin with... Because we're so divided. We are, but I, I pride myself. So even though I am clearly partisan, one of my repu part of my reputation before I ran for office uh, for governor, it, although if you look at my campaign, not, there's nothing divisive about it, but I was known as someone who could work across the aisle. I was the leader of the Democrats. But my job was to get stuff done. So what I would tell my colleagues who would get mad that I wasn't always angry, I'm like, look, my first job is cooperation because people don't care about our politics. They care about their lives. We are the minority party. We don't get anything unless the other guys say we can have it. And I'm not gonna be so righteously indignant that I deny my constituents access to the things they need. So my first job is to find where we can work together. My second job is to be competitive. Your ideas are dumber than mine, so I'm gonna give you the right ideas. <laughs> and I'm gonna to try to do what I can to get you to buy into those ideas. And then my third job was accountability. If you didn't listen, or if you did, I needed the people who worked with us or who relied on us to be able to hold us responsible. And so one of the ways I do that is that I don't believe in conversion. So my, my parents, my, when I was growing up, my mom was a librarian, my dad was a shipyard worker, they're both uh, retired United Methodist ministers now, so they became pastors when I was in high school. I'm glad you're talking about them. I was gonna ask you about that, because I grew up in the church and I have a lot of questions. Well, we'll ask. <laughs> so this'll, this'll, you'll appreciate this. Okay, good. So my parents were pastors. Yes. Their job was conversion. Like, they've got to save people's souls. That's a lot of work. Oh. <laughs> and we try to do that in conversation. We try to convert people. One of the ways I talk to folks is I don't try to convert them. I don't need to change your core beliefs 
I need to convince you that what you think you know can help you do the thing I need done. I don't do conversion, I do convincing. Mm. Convincing means you are going to find that we can come to the same place for completely different reasons. And my favorite example, and then we can talk about church. My favorite <laughs> example was that in the legislature, uh, there was this terrible envir anti-environmental bill that was moving through with grease lightning in the Senate. And the governor wanted it, the chamber wanted it, the lieutenant governor wanted it, they got it through the Senate, they got it over to the House, and the speaker was convinced it was gonna pass. I was not so sure. So I called the head of the Tea Party, and she and I went to lunch. She does not, I was like, you don't believe in climate change. She's like, nope. I was like, God's just crying, like whatever. Um, <laughs> And I, I, and I didn't try oh to convince her. I said, but you do believe in property values. And she was like, yeah. And I said, well, what they're trying to do will diminish your property values but raise your property taxes because you're going to have to pay for these companies to erode these stream buffers, and it's going to be your constituents who are going to spend their money paying for somebody else's mistake. Mm. And she was like, oh. And I said, yeah. So, and I said, so you should work with me to kill this bill because I don't have enough votes. But if you can bring your, I've got my 60, and with your 35, we've got enough to pull this off. And we blocked that bill for three years. Wow. <laughs> and they eventually pulled it. And so I, I say that to say, can we, we spend so much time trying to make people believe what we believe. I just need you to do what I need you to do. And so my job is to listen and find out what is it that you need. So the way we get through this, we want someone, to, we are so focused on getting someone else to believe our version of the world that if we could hear their version, we might figure out how we get to whatever place we're trying to get to. Wow. So. You make it seem easy, but it's, it's Oh no, it's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> right. um, can you talk about your parents and your influence, their influence on you and your writing and your, and your work? I can, but you gotta tell me what you meant by being raised in the church. Okay, so <clears throat> my dad's an elder at the church. My mother um, is a chondosanim. It's like a deacon, I guess, at mm -hmm. the church. And I grew up going to small, uh, Korean American family church, so few families, not a mega church, um, and going to church Wednesday, Bible study, choir practice, Sunday night, I just felt like I spent a lot of time at church, oh, wow. um, and it really impacted me, and I, I feel like I explained to somebody um, my personal faith and my faith is, is like an extension of my identity. It's hard to separate it now, like being Korean. And for the Korean Americans, I don't want to talk about myself, I don't want to talk about Stacey, but being <laughs> Korean and being Christian, it's like such a part, it's like being a woman, it's, it's mm -hmm. just so ingrained, it's hard to detach it. And don't get me wrong, I feel like there's been a personal evolution and a lot of conflict and a lot of questions and doubts in my own personal journey, but um, it's hard and it's, I feel like it's getting harder. You know, you felt like as a child, when I became an adult, I'd have it figured out and my oh, yeah. relationship with God would be stronger and my faith would be stronger and I could impart that on my children. Oh my goodness, it's harder every day, you know? Well, uh, so my parents, they told, I remember I was like 12 or 13, something happened, we were doing something in church, and I said something uh, that was impertinent. <laughs> and my mother said, you know, Stacy, you're gonna have to find Jesus for yourself. We're not taking you to heaven with us. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very sobering reality for <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and she like, they widen the gaze all of us. Like, yeah, we're not, we bring you to church so you can figure out how to get there on your own. Like, we're not taking you with us. That has stuck with me. <laughs> In fact, I'm, I think I'm still mad. But, um, but, my, but that's how my parents were. My mom, they are. So my, my mom and dad, even before they became pastors, I, like they, they became pastors when they were 40. They were preaching, they were preachy all the time. And we were... For most of my formative years, we were we were First Baptist, but we became Methodist, and so we only ever went to small churches. Uh, so we were Black Methodists in Mississippi. So like, like we're two or more gathered. <laughs> <laughs> I totally feel that. See, I really yeah. feel that. I mean, I'm the second of six kids, so when we would go to certain churches, they thought the visiting choir had arrived. <laughs> I'm like, we don't sing. <laughs> we can sing along, but we are not gonna. We we're very disappointing. <laughs> Uh, but, but my parents raised us with, they, they, had, they said we had three jobs, go to church, go to school, take care of each other. Mm -hmm. Go to church because they wanted us to have this faith tradition because apparently they were going to leave us behind if the rapture. <laughs> um, 
literally. <laughs> 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 See ya. <Okay>. Um, <laughs> but they wanted us to have, because we were, we were what my mom calls a genteel poor. Uh, we had no money, but we watched PBS and we read books. <laughs> <laughs> and so they wanted, like my mom and my dad were very intentional about our faith because they wanted us to know that there was something beyond the things we didn't have. We went to school with kids with a lot more money and a lot more resources. We were often the only black kids in our classes. So we had race issues that we were doing, and we were in Mississippi. So there were all these layers to what we were grappling with, and they wanted us to have something larger than ourselves to hold on to. So church, and we went to church a lot. When my parents became pastors, I think there was like a three or four week span where we were in church every day because of revival. Oh. I'm like, I went to church enough that I skipped it for like three years. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm all out, caught right? up. I'm good. <laughs> But then the second job was education. They wanted us to know, and, and my mom before, um, so my dad was a shipyard worker, and just in, incredibly industrious. And my dad uh, is dyslexic and didn't learn to read until he was in his 30s. So he memorized his way through school. And that's part of a, one of the gifts I give Avery. I have a, a pretty good memory uh, that I think I inherited from my dad. Uh, and my, my father really instilled in us this responsibility like he couldn't miss a day of class because if he wasn't in the classroom, he literally couldn't know what happened because he couldn't read it later on. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom is just a nerd and brilliant. And so she, but she dropped out of school in fourth grade because her family couldn't afford it. And this is public school. She couldn't afford the bus. They were incredibly poor. Like my, my dad says that he's from the wrong side of the tracks, but my mom from the wrong side of the wrong side of the tracks. <laughs> and so for both of them, education was this passport and so they were incredibly intentional. And my mom was a reference librarian when I was growing up. So it's all the other reason I do such deep research, because when you say you want to know something pre-Google, my mom said, look it up. And you couldn't say, well, I don't know how. Like, there was an entire library. Mm -hmm. Like, I memorized the Dewey Decimal System, <laughs> because she said, look it up. There were all these books to tell you. And then the third was take care of each other. Part of it was free babysitting, because there were so many of us. Uh, but the other part was that we had this responsibility to other people that you had to take care of family and community. And it wasn't just because your faith demanded it, it was because your soul should not be fulfilled if you weren't doing for others. So that's my parents. Oh, that's so wonderful. <clears throat> now I have so many more questions. I don't have yeah. enough time, but you know, you mentioned you ran for governor twice. I know a lot okay. of people want to know if you plan to run for elected office again at some point. I know I'm just going to have to ask that question. Get out of that. That was a real segue, man. I have to just I just sneak it in. Sorry, <laughs> I I just sneak it in. Talking about my parents in. and there you go. So I am not done with politics. I do not. I don't know what job. I don't know which job, but I do know politics is a tool for policy. I've tried to organize my life so that if I do not get the platform of a certain job, that doesn't diminish my responsibility to get the work done. And so, and I think that's one of the things that's frustrating to some other folks about me, because I won't just disappear. Like, you're not gonna get rid of me that easy. I, it, is an e it, is a, it is more straightforward to do some of the work that I believe has to be done to hold certain jobs. It just, and not getting those jobs does not exempt me from that obligation and it's not gonna distract me from the necessity. So there will be, somebody agrees. Um, <laughs> there will be a time where I stand for public office again. I don't know when and I don't know for what, but I do know I will. We have your answer. You know, I had to ask and I felt like, you I know, know, that's probably connected to your family in some way and all the values they've instilled in you. Um, Something exciting. I don't know. I have so many questions. How do you have time to redo all this research <laughs> with the advocacy work that you do and, and the work you said, the constant politics that you're still doing? Plus, she is Howard University's inaugural Robert W. Walters Endowed Chair for Race and Black Politics. Right? She has a book. I mean, you have another book coming out in 2025. So two questions, where do you find the time? Because you clearly research deeply. Um, you are committed to your community um, and you now have this role at Howard and I know you want to impart a lot to the students and the community there. Can we talk about all of that and the space sure. that you have? So I believe in, I think work-life balance is a lie. 
Agreed. Oh my it is. gosh. It is a lie. There's no such thing. The, the only people There's... who have it don't really work. Like they, <laughs> There's no such thing. Like it's, it's perfect balance when one, half of it doesn't have to happen or when you can pay someone to do all of that. So for the rest of us, I believe in work-life Jenga. Okay. Work I'm writing so, this down. And, and actually, I talk about it in my book, Lead from the Outside. Yeah. Um, <laughs> available at your local bookstore. But what I mean is this. You've, you've got all of these things that pull on your attention and pull on your time. And uh, President Eisenhower had this quadrant of uh, this taxonomy of how to think about the world. You have things that are important and urgent things that are important but not urgent, things that are urgent but not important, mm. and things that are neither urgent nor important. I take that concept and my Jenga concept and mash them together. So I take all the things I want to do, all the things that draw my attention, writing, teaching, uh, I'm working with uh, Rewiring America, working on electrification, I have a production company, I, I do a lot of stuff. I stack those things up. And each day, my job is to figure out which thing is urgent and important, which thing is really important but not urgent. So I can leave it there for a second, but I need to be thinking about it. Which thing is urgent but not important? And that one, whose fault is it? <laughs> if it's urgent because of me, then I'm going to do it. If it's urgent because of someone else, I'm going to figure out if I still like them or not. And who else, who else gets harmed or helped if I don't do it or if I do? And then if it's not urgent and not important, we often are sort of, our instinct is to leave that space alone. I spend time there because the things that are not urgent and not important are the things that renew your capacity to do the other three. When you neglect that one, you become mean and bitter and snippy with mm. everybody else or you diminish your capacity in those other places. And then you stack all the things up and I have an extraordinary chief of staff who hates my description of this because she knows that she's the person who has to figure all of this out. But for example, the book that's due next is, it's, I know it's, okay, this sounds obnoxious, but it, it's only to get the draft done. It'll take me 40 days. I know it takes me roughly 40 days to write a book. Not in, it's, but it's good to know. It is, it is. I, so I write, I can write 2,500 words in a day. And wow. typically my books need to be between 100 and 115,000 words. So that's 40 days. I know then I need to back from their research. And so on the drive down from Philadelphia to here, so I'm writing about AI again, but a different facet of AI. So I now know way too much about deep neural networks. Oh my goodness. We should all be preparing ourselves to genuflect to our AI overlords because oh they are my. coming. <laughs> oh no. I'm not joking. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, so I'm studying that right now and I'm listening, I'm reading two books and listening to a third book about it. So I've, I've absorbed a lot of information about that to the topics that I need to talk about in this book. And I do it in the places where something is important but not urgent, although now we've moved into the urgent and important to me to get this done. I will not do something that I want to do because this takes primacy. But I know when this is due, so I also am stacking the next set of things that have to come. I think I can get a lot of things done because I, I'm intentional about what needs to be done. I am thoughtful about who needs it and why. But I also give myself permission to not get everything right the first time or exactly right. I am not a perfectionist. I am a very goodest. <laughs> like, like perfectionists can't move because they need everything. Hey, Susan. Um, I'm a very goodest, meaning I need to get as close to perfect as I can with the constraints I've put on myself with everything else. And when you're a very goodest, you wake up and work out, but maybe you don't. <laughs> that doesn't, but, so what I've learned is that doesn't mean I, I just go crazy. It just means I do less of what I expected, or I do it in a way that I hadn't anticipated, or I schedule time to get it done again. But I give myself permission to not be perfect at it because that's, more, that's much more of a paralytic than anything else. Mm -hmm. And what about your role at Howard? Hmm? What, what about your role at Howard? What do you want to impart and so, teach students? So, Ms. Walters, please stand up. Thank you. Thank you. So, I've been very, I'm, I'm the first one, so they've let me make it up. Um, as you may have noticed, I don't do things the way I'm told. So with this, 
instead of teaching a traditional course, I actually run a speaker series. Uh, I was here last month for the speaker series and we actually had the students, I got to interview the student newspaper. So, and then I interviewed four or more students to really show the young people there what they already know and how bright and determined they are. Uh, we're going to have Kimball Walden, who was the uh, acting director of cybersecurity for the White House on campus this month. And so I'm setting up conversations because I want them to see what they already have and help them investigate what they know. I am also working with a number of programs on campus to really think about how do we, instead of creating something new, how do we take what exists and leverage that for the conversation of race and black politics. DEI is under attack, and, and this is not about a course that you took in college or something you had to do on a Thursday because HR sent you down there. DEI is the description of 248 years of struggle to make this country what it's supposed to be. Diversity simply means all people. Equity simply means fair access to opportunity. And inclusion basically is how do we make certain everyone can make it to the American dream. And whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, the gender rights movement, the LGBTQIA movement, the labor movement, the disability movement, those are all parts of DEI. It's in the name. And if we allow them to reduce DEI to some you know, trope, then we are allowing them to dismantle all of the infrastructure that we have painstakingly built. And Howard is providing me a wonderful opportunity to help people connect the dots between AI and DEI, mm -hmm. between healthcare and DEI, between law and de journalism and DEI. All of the things that have made us a better, stronger, more inclusive nation are under attack because the opponents don't like the fact that it works and is working. And we are going to fight that. It's 6.52, I have to ask, I, there are some audience questions I do wanna to get to. I just wanna ask a couple of fun questions yes. though. Um, so, are there any books about DC or shows that you have loved? Tell me like your favorites. West Wing and Scandal. Oh my gosh, Scandal. <laughs> I've read, I rewatched Scandal recently, yeah. cause it's on Hulu, so we had oh, to yeah. watch the whole thing West all Wing again. and Scandal are great. Would They're you great. write an episode, like what would it be oh. about? See, here's the danger of that. We don't have that kind of time. I know, I know, I know. You're right, you're right. Okay. But yes, those are my two. And what about books? I th so I don't read as many political thrillers, which sounds weird, but <laughs> but part of, part of what I try to do as a writer, I, I love to read other writers, but I try to be careful when I'm writing not to read too much because sometimes appreciation can turn into plagiarism. I think that makes sense. <laughs> and I don't do that. So I, I'm intentional about making sure that when I read, I'm reading things that are counter to what I'm writing. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, oh my gosh, I wish I had more time. Um, I think we can do a couple of extra minutes. Go ahead. Okay. So I read that while Justice Sleep is going to be turned into some kind of television series. It is under development. We're in, uh, it's under development with my production company and working title pictures. So. We're, we're in the process, we're trying to get it done. Can you tell us anything? Like, do you have a dream cast, like, in your mind? My dream is that we get green-lighted to do the, the, to do the show. <laughs> no, 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 I, I do. I know who I, I see, but I don't want to say okay, that. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, that's good. What, so what books do you like to read? Are, are there inspirations for your writing? Who are the women you admire? I, I read Everything, everything except okay. horror. I do not like. Me I don't understand why people want to be scared or watch <laughs> horror movies. Oh the no, the world I'm, is scary enough. No, my sister read uh, Stephen King when we were younger and told me about the Stand. I'm like, I don't ever want to read a word he writes. <laughs> and then The Shining came on ABC, oh. and I'm like, I was right. <laughs> I'm not doing this again. I mean, love Stephen King, fantastic writer. Right. I guess I don't. I, <laughs> I don't want to cast aspersions, but I won't ever know for sure. Um, that said, so I, I read like fiction. I usually try to read a fiction, nonfiction, so, and then sort of something fun that I have read before because like, I like rewatching TV. I like rereading books, especially mm -hmm. books that kind of like pulling a blanket around you. So yes, right now I one am. Which ones? Hmm? Yeah, I'm, I'm, okay. I can't, I'm excited <laughs> to hear what those are. So uh, I'm. 
finishing up, so I'm reading The Last Lion uh, about Winston Churchill. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, three volume set on <laughs> Churchill. Huh? Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to be having a conversation with you guys. Um, <laughs> I was like, wait, what, what do you know? Uh, <laughs> so I'm reading that. I am, so the Kaiju Preservation Society, which is this fantastic uh, novel. And then I'm rereading a Nora Roberts novel because it just makes me happy. Oh, Nora Roberts. See? Um, I need to read. Sometimes I feel like I shouldn't go back and watch the same things. I feel yeah, like, again, it's the, it's the time management thing. Like, let yeah. myself do something because yes. there's so much to read that I haven't read. But maybe I'm just going to go back and read something. So maybe. here's how I think about reading. Reading is for information. It is for pleasure. It is for comfort. I break those up sometimes. Sometimes they come together in the same book. But I never regret. I, I don't believe it. Like the, the phrase that drives me up the wall, a trashy novel. No, it may not be your cup of tea, but if some, like romance is one of the hardest things, and not just because I write romance, but when somebody already knows the end of your book, you gotta work hard to get them all the way through it. <laughs> and the capacity of storytellers to, like Brenda Jackson and Beverly Jenkins and Nora Roberts to tell those stories is something that I love because it's also, it's why we watch Hallmark movies. And it's, I mean, I, I don't yes. mind just- Give me the happy ending. Yeah, just let me sink in there. And yes. look, maybe if I keep reading about him and writing about him, he'll show up. I don't know where <laughs> he is. With that, I do um, <laughs> want to ask you some audience questions. There were so many, so we just had to pick a few. Um, this is a question that says, what is the political mood of young people, 18 to 40 in Georgia, are they driven by international conflicts? So the mood is the same nationwide and international political conflict, which is a, a nice, nicely euphemistic way of asking the question, they are taking in what they see as a continuation of George Floyd, what they see as a through line of what our nation says it will be and what it actually shows itself to be. And we can decide where that, what the answer is, but if you remember being that young, it is the time where hypocrisy is the most, most divisive and most corrosive. And so the extent to which they believe there is hypocrisy or worse, where there is disdain, it is going to inform how they think they fit in. Young people never vote at the levels of other populations. It's just, it's the nature of things. Your sense of invincibility and your disconnect from how things happen make it harder to muster that. But it's your, your sense of disappointment when someone tells you this is the most important election in your lifetime and that's all you've heard your whole lifetime. Mm -hmm. And then, but also things don't, things fall apart, but they don't completely collapse. And so you also have the, I mean, I, I'm, I have a, I call her my borrowed teenager. My, um, my niece lives with me, she's 17. And there is no tougher critic than a 17 year old. You can lose your entire sense of self <laughs> if you put on the wrong outfit or use oh. the word the wrong way, oh my God. So now, and now we're saying choose leaders. <laughs> Their skepticism is legion. Mm. And therefore, they are watching what happens, they are analyzing it and they're synthesizing it, but they also haven't forgotten what we said the last time. And so we have to create space and give credence to the legitimacy of their processing of this information. Castigation doesn't work. If you ever successfully lectured a teenager into doing anything, congratulations to you. <laughs> For the rest of us who are not wizards, the work we have to do is not lecturing them into thinking, understanding why they're wrong and we're right, but giving mm -hmm. them the tools and the context so that they can understand what it means to do, to not do, or to forfeit. And the way I talk about it, look, it's like a game. If you don't vote, it's not as though you, it's nullified. You've just forfeited your vote, you forfeited your chance to be in the game. And if you do that, the other side who you may not, you may not like this side, but if you despise the other side or if you think it doesn't matter, they're going to win. Like if you are in a, a sports league, if you don't show up for the game, 
it doesn't, they don't just scratch it off the cards. The other guy gets an extra point. Mm. That's what happens when we don't engage. And so instead of trying to, to say, oh, you have to do this because people died for it, which is legitimate, or because this happened, it's having a conversation about why don't you want to vote? What is it that hurts you? What are you afraid of? What are you excited about? It's engaging them in conversation instead of leading them with lecture. Mm -hmm. Because if you leave them with lecture, they're going to leave you behind. Gosh, thank you. Uh, and I have teenagers in my house, and the withering looks I get when oh, I come down the stairs. Seriously? Oh, I oh. I had a T-shirt I thought was cute. I think I burned it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it is. Like, it, yeah. My daughter. I mean, the things she has said to me. Just real quick. She. I once wore this cute. It was like it looked like a lace applique. And she said, um, "Are you trying to be a founding father?" <laughs> I had to give her credit though. I was like, yeah. that was quick and smart. Oh yeah. You know? Like you want, you want to beat them, but they were actually funny and right. And right. Like, right. I look like, at it and it oh. came up to here, so I was like, oh gosh, okay, never mind. Mm -hmm. Not in the rotation anymore. Okay. Yeah. What do you believe is your greatest achievement thus far? I, I don't know. I, I will say this. I okay. don't measure my work in that way. Okay. I I measure progress. Uh, not victory, because victory, I come from a space where victory is not, not only is it not guaranteed, it's, it's really, really hard. And if you get it, it's not, too, it's not yours for very long. Uh, but the, the first that I can list are first for a reason, and while other people celebrate them, I'm like, it's sad, because I haven't been here this, I mean, I'm 50. And some of the things I've gotten to first should have been done a whole lo a long time ago. And so I don't count those necessarily as victories, but I count them as progress. And I know it's, it's irked people when I have celebrated that progress, when I encourage others to celebrate that progress saying we won. My mission was to say we have to celebrate the fact that we're not where we were. My father was arrested at the age of 14 for registering black people to vote. His daughter became the first black woman in American history to be the nominee for governor. I didn't get the job. I didn't get the job, but the fact that I could even conceptualize it was because of what he did. My mother's father was born 25 years after the end of slavery. And so I think about things not only on a longitudinal space, but contextualizing myself in the scope of what could have been, but for those who did means that victory is a nice to have, not a need to have. What I need to have is progress, and that's what I measure. Wow. And I think if we could take more of that attitude, I think we could accomplish more, because we're not always looking at the end. Exactly. Um, how can we best strengthen our voting system? Three things. End voter suppression by making sure democracy doesn't depend on your geography. Uh, we need the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. We need to have uniformity that allows formerly incarcerated persons to vote. If you paid your time, you, I mean, Vermont, you get to vote the whole time. But we need to actually believe that citizenship means the right to vote. We need to remove the barriers to voting. Yes, you should know who's casting a ballot but we should not create barriers that, disenfran that disenfranchise and sorry, disincentivize voting. Mm -hmm. Mobile voting is something we should start thinking about. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly how we make that work, although there have been some interesting experiments in this country. Uh, and we need to eliminate the Electoral College because your vote should count. <laughs> 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 Not, and not to pander to my audience, but DC should have the right to vote for everything. All right, last question. This is, this is a big one. Okay. What's your forecast? Forecast is the word for the upcoming elections in November. They will happen. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm putting my money on Joe Biden, so there. Stacey Abrams, I, I'm so grateful for this time together. You are as brilliant as you are funny and engaging as we expect you to be. Um, 
I feel like I needed to take notes, but since I was listening hard and I couldn't, now usually I'm the one like with the notebook writing all the notes, um, but I hope, I, I hope you have taken away as much as I have from this conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody.